All right, Job chapter 40, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible reads, Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Now, in this passage, we see Job's great humility before Almighty God. Let's not lose perspective of the fact, however, that Job chapters 1 and 2 made it very clear to us that Job was the most righteous man living on the earth at that time. Don't ever forget that. Very clearly, the Bible tells us that he was a perfect and an upright man that feared God and eschewed evil. And when God spoke to Satan about him, he said, As thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth that feareth God and escheweth evil. So he was the greatest man living on the earth at that time. But the greatest man on the earth is still so much lower than God. And that's what God's teaching us here. It's not that God is ripping on Job for being a bad guy or accusing Job of having done all these things. Of course, uh, God, if you, if you read all the words of Job in the book of Job, you won't find Job uh, basically reproving God or, or claiming to be like God or, or claiming to know all the things that God asked him about over the past few chapters or claiming to have all the power of God. You know, Job even showed humility throughout uh, the book of Job. He never said that his own hand could save him. He very clearly talked about uh, Jesus as being his redeemer. Of course, he didn't call him by the name of Jesus because that name was not revealed in the Old Testament. But he talked about his Redeemer coming in the last days and, and resurrecting him from the earth. He talked about God being his Savior and so forth. So what we can learn from this is that even the greatest man on the planet is still nothing compared to God's holiness, his power, his greatness. It reminds me of what Jesus said when he said, among them that are born of women, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So if the greatest man living on the earth at that time was this humble before God to say, man, I, you know, I can't answer you. I'm vile. I'm going to lay my hand upon my mouth. How much more should we be humble? Because we're not even close to Job's level of greatness or righteousness. How much more should we humble ourselves before the Lord? And the Bible says, humble yourselves Therefore, in the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Humble yourselves in the sight that he shall lift you up. The Bible says that we should be meek and humble before God. And that's what we see Job doing here in chapter 40. Now, when it comes to what God is asking him about, over chapters 38 and 39, he was asking him just if he was able to uh, perform all kinds of acts of, of greatness that only God could perform. Ask him if he knew all kinds of knowledge that only God could know. But he has a different line of questioning now in chapter 40. Really, chapter 40, there are two sections to what God speaks to Job about. First of all, he talks to Job about salvation. And then in the second half of chapter 40, he talks about a great beast that he has created called Behemoth. Okay, and then the entire chapter 41 is going to be at about another great beast known as Leviathan. Okay, but let's start reading in verse number six. It says, Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Now, let me just point out also the statement, Gird up now. He said, Gird up thy loins now like a man. Now, what does that mean to gird up your loins like a man? This would be similar to when we would say, you know, to roll up your sleeves. It basically, it's an action that denotes that you're about to perform some kind of a task or do some kind of a work. You know, and before you get to work, you know, you might unbutton your cuffs, roll up your sleeves just to not be encumbered by a long sleeve garment. You know, this might be a taking off your coat, you know, before going to work and doing something. This is talking about the fact that in those days, they would wear long and flowing robes. You know, they would wear coats. And, and keep in mind, the Bible uses these words often interchangeably. Robe, coat, mantle, garment, you know, whatever it calls it. And it's something that goes over your clothing. Now, a lot of people have this bizarre doctrine that men didn't wear pants back then, but that rather they just wore just a coat. 
And you say, where do they get this idea? From every single piece of Sunday school literature that's ever been produced on the planet? I mean, when was the last time you saw Sunday school literature with a guy in pants? You never see it. And, and this has led people to the bizarre stupidity that pants weren't even invented. I've even had people say, you know, pants weren't invented back then. So basically, the people who built the pyramids, the people who built the aqueducts, the, you know, the people who built these great walled cities, and the people who uh, came up with all these steel weapons and stuff, they just, it, pants never occurred to them. <laughs> you know, and here's how pants, by the way, I know how pants were invented. This is how pants were invented. One day, a guy accidentally grabbed his shirt, and he started putting it on. He accidentally put his legs through the armholes of his shirt. And then he realized, wait a minute, I might be, you know, I might be onto something. Because some of the greatest inventions have been, you know, if I could just get rid of this hole in the middle, you know, maybe change this. But, you know, that's how some of the greatest inventions have come about, through accidents like that. But, I mean, how bizarre of a teaching. Hey, pants didn't exist back then. But then I noticed somebody uh, sent me a news article recently. They dug up uh, some fossilized thing of somebody wearing pants like, you know, 5,000 years ago. What a shock. Amazing. This, I mean, this, this is a game changer, folks. They had pants back then. But honestly, someone believing that pants weren't around back then, is, that, that's just ignorance. I mean, even just reading any secular history book, you know, for example, a, a famous example is the Battle of Thermopylae, where you have the Greeks facing the Persians, and the Persians made a mockery of the Greeks because the Greeks w wore so little clothing. And they considered the Greeks to be effeminate because they were long-haired and they would comb their hair and make themselves real pretty, and they're pretty much in their underwear. Whereas the Persians wore pants down to the ankles. And this, this we're talking about hundreds of years before Christ. And even a secular history book will talk about the difference in clothing between the two sides. And, and you know, I mean, you just have to be pretty foolish to think that pants weren't around back then. And let me tell you something. The working man has always worn pants because of the fact that, you know, it's not practical to go to work in a toga. You know, that works great for some kind of a beer drinking college party to put on a toga or some stupidity like that. But, you know, people who actually have to work for a living need garments that are a little more practical than that. So this idea of just, oh, they just wore togas because they have pictures of some just really royal Caesars and everything. Because guess what? There aren't a lot of pictures from back then. So we don't know what they wore except for what we read in the Bible if we really want to trust something. But they'll have a picture of some Roman Caesar in a toga with an olive leaf wreath. That's not how the common man dressed. You know, throughout it. Now, look, I'm not saying that everybody always wore pants that go down to the ankles. The Bible talks a lot about pants that just go to the knee. We would call those shorts, but the Bible calls them britches or pants. You know, pants that could go down to the knee, pants that might go mid-calf, pants that might go down to the ankles. But the point is, men have worn pants throughout history, and the Bible five times talks about men wearing britches, which are pants. That's just another word for pants. People talk about being too big for their britches. I mean, that's a word that we still would even use today. But people still say, no, 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 Pastor Anderson, they didn't wear pants. You know, I said, Jesus wore pants. They say, no, 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 you're crazy. You're, you know, you're a radical, you know, for teaching that. They want us to believe that these guys just went around in like a trench coat with nothing else. I mean, that's just ridiculous. It's bizarre. You wouldn't be able to work effectively. And here's what's funny. The reason why people want to do that is because they don't like the teaching that men and women should dress differently. That men should wear pants and that women should wear skirts and dresses. Amen. So they just have to say, oh, everybody was in a dress back then. Everybody was in a dress. Jesus was in a dress. You know, they're all in a dress. But, you know, in reality, the Bible says a woman should not wear that which pertains to a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are an abomination to the Lord thy God. And you say, well, you know, that was back then. That was in the Old Testament. We're free in Christ. Well, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, there were a lot of things that changed about the law. Cross-dressing wasn't one of them. You know, Jesus didn't die on the cross to liberate women from feminine clothing. He didn't die on the cross so that men could wear dresses. I mean, that, what kind of a bizarre doctrine? You know, yeah, he fulfilled the Sabbath. He fulfilled the dietary laws. He fulfilled the Levitical priesthood and the temple. He didn't die for people to be able to all dress the same now. You know, the, oh, thank God we're living in the New Testament where my wife and I can just both throw on a pair of coveralls and just be dressed exactly the same as one another. No, the Bible's real clear. There's a principle of saying, hey, you know, men have short hair. You know, women have long hair. Men wear pants. You know, women uh, don't. And you say, well, where does the Bible say that women don't wear pants? Well, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that a woman should not wear that which pertains to a man. 
Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abominations of the Lord thy God. Let me ask you this. Isn't that saying that there's some garment that's a man's garment that a woman shouldn't put on? There's something. I mean, let's not argue yet about what that is. There's some kind of clothing that pertains to men that women should not put on, according to that, right? And then there's some kind of a woman's garment that men shouldn't be putting on. Now, if I came to church in a dress, would you say I'm in violation of that standard? Would anyone doubt that I'm in violation of that standard? You say, well, you're putting on a woman's garment. Now, what if I said, well, it's a really manly dress? Camoed out, you know, or, or <laughs> you know, maybe it's, maybe it's denim, you know, or whatever. Okay, you'd still say you're in violation. You're wearing a woman's garment. You're wearing a dress. You're wearing a skirt. Okay, but here's what's funny then. But then if you say, well, pants are a man's garment, it's like, whoa, no, 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 that's not true. Pants go both ways. Pants go both ways. But here's the thing. Okay, let's, I'll give that to you. Pants go both ways. Then what's a man's garment that women can't put on? Do, 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 do. See, you have to use the process of elimination. If there's something that God says women shouldn't be putting on, because according to the, do if you say, well, it's okay for women to wear pants, then here's what you're saying. Women can wear everything. They can wear pants, they can wear skirts, they can wear dresses. They, they, women can wear everything. Nothing's off limits for women. But for men, it's only pants that are allowed. Pants only. No skirts, no dresses. You say, well, it's based on culture. It's based on society. Well, our society is getting pretty weird. So if you want to base it on that, you know, you're in for a wild ride. Because, you know, our society has some pretty weird standards that are constantly changing. Now, there, like I said, there are five times that pants are mentioned. It's always associated with men wearing pants. You know, you don't see a mention of, of women wearing pants. And, and the thing is, to me, if you just look at the universal sign for a man and a woman, just look at the bathroom door. And it's clear, you know, one of them's pants, one of them's a skirt. You know, that, that's, so that's where this derives from. This idea that, you know, men wear pants and that women wear skirts and dresses. And in the United States, everybody agrees. My dad, listen to this, my dad was a teenager in the 1960s in Los Angeles, California. Now, does that sound like a, 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 a Christian stronghold of the Bible Belt? Late 60s, Los Angeles, California, and women were not allowed to wear. You couldn't wear to the public school. Girls could not wear pants to the public school. So, I mean, our, it was completely uh, just accepted in our society that that's just the way things are. Men dress like men, women dress like women. You say, well, times change. But you know what? If anything, in 2014, we need more distinction between the genders, not less. Why would we sit there and get all unisexed out in our attire with all the weird stuff that's going on. If anything, we need more distinction between men and women, not less. And when you, when you think about it that way, you know, you can see that uh, obviously there's something that God doesn't want women to wear that's, that's, that pertains to a man. And there's something that, that God doesn't want men to wear that pertains to a woman. And, and you know, shirts, it's not a shirt. It's, you know, it's not a sweater. It's not a jacket. I mean, those things all are just basic piece of clothing. The difference between a, a man's clothing and a woman's clothing is, is pants versus a skirt. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious, but, but people who don't like that are going to resist that, even though it's just kind of common sense in my opinion. But here's what people will often say, and this is what I think is so funny. They'll say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Anderson, women can't always wear skirts and dresses because it's not practical, they'll say. You know, there's so much that they couldn't do unless they wore pants. I mean, it's just not practical. And then these same people will turn around, oh, everybody wore a skirt and dress in the Bible. So on one hand, they're like, well, how's a woman going to go horseback riding in a, in a skirt? But then it's like, oh, every person in the Bible, all those millions of people who rode horses in the Bible, they were all on skirts. It's like, well, which one is it? You know, what I mean? like, like either... Either it's possible to do stuff in a skirt or it's not. If it's impossible to ride into battle in a skirt, then why are you telling me that all the people in the Bible did it? And, 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 you know, and if it's possible to do all that, then why are you complaining about wearing a skirt or dress if you can do everything? That, I mean, everything that happened in the Bible, if you're claiming that everybody was wearing a dress, well, they could do all the same things. You know, and honestly, you can do everything that you need to do in a skirt or a dress if you want to. You know, my wife only wears skirts and dresses. My daughters only wear skirts and dresses. And honestly, they, they've gone to, um, you know, they've gone horseback riding, for example. You, you know, yeah, you can't wear a, a, a tight skirt. 
you know, horseback riding. But if you have a long, flowing, full skirt, you can actually ride that horseback riding. You can go on a roller coaster. You can do whatever. You know, my, my family, even when we go swimming somewhere, my, my wife and daughters, they all wear swim dresses. You're not going to believe this, but they don't show their naked rear end to the whole world when they go swimming. Isn't that radical? We're, the, we're like the Taliban over here. We're like radical Islam. I mean, they actually don't show their naked rear end publicly. They actually wear clothing that covers their body. What a concept. You know, and, and guess what? They actually look pretty cool. They don't look like, uh, you know, oh, man, it's embarrassing. Actually, every time my wife and daughters go anywhere publicly and go swimming somewhere in their swim dresses, they get compliments on them every single time because they look very good. They look nice, but they're modest. They're not revealing of their bodies. So again, the reason I'm bringing all this up, you say, what in the world does this have to do with Job 40? I want to hear about Behemoth. Well, hold on, you know, we'll get to, we'll get to Behemoth, okay? But, but first of all, let's talk about the elephant in the room. You know, no, I'm just kidding, but anyway. He says, gird up thy loins like a man. Why would he say gird up thy loins like a man? Because here's the thing, if you're a woman and you're wearing a skirt or dress and you were to gird up your loins, what does it mean to gird up your loins? The girdle or the girding would be some kind of a belt or a sash, you know, something around the waist. So if you were to gird up your loins, what you're basically doing is taking some fabric from down here and, and, and sticking it in your belt or in your girdle. Well, here's the thing. If you're a woman, you're not going to do that because there's nothing underneath. Because you're wearing a dress or a skirt, you're not going to be able to gird up your loins like a man. Whereas if you're a man, you have a pair of pants or breeches or what we would consider long shorts on, then when you go out to work, let's say you're going to go running, you know, you don't want your robe or your coat to be flapping everywhere. So you're going to basically gird that up. You know what I'm saying? And you'd basically grab the tails of your robe or your coat or your garment and you'd shove them into your belt. Basically, that's what they would do to get it out of the way. So they would gird up their loins in preparation for doing something. See, the Bible is clear. You know, Jesus had a coat because if you remember Jesus' coat, they, they wanted it after he died because it was, a, it was kind of an expensive coat because it was all made of one piece of fabric. It, it didn't have any seam. So that coat was something that Jesus wore. But here's where the Sunday school literature gets it wrong. That's not all he wore. You know, I wear a coat too. And when I lived in Chicago, I would wear a big, long, flowing coat that went down, you know, close to my ankles. Big woolen overcoat because it was cold. But I, didn't, I never went out of the house. I didn't even go to Walmart at 2 a.m with just that wool coat on. Because you know what? That, you know, it's not, you know, as a man, you wear pants. Why? Because it, you say, well, what's the difference? Well, because, you know, with women, they wear skirts and dresses and everything, but they're not doing the same type of things that men are doing. And so, therefore, it's easier for them to be modest and everything like that. That's why it doesn't just say gird up your loins, but it says gird up your loins like a man. Okay. And again, you say, well, I disagree with you, Pastor Anderson. It's, you know what? That's fine if you disagree with me, but you're wrong. And the bathroom door proves you wrong. American history proves you wrong. You know, and, and honestly, if you, if you walk away from this sermon saying that I'm wrong, that's fine. But I just want to tell you one thing. If you walk away from this sermon saying, you know what, I still think it's okay for women to wear pants, then here's what you're going to have to work out for yourself in your own mind. What is the men's apparel that God's telling women not to wear? You know, and if you, if you decide that it's something different than pants, then that's fine. That's between you and God. But you know what? I think you're going to have a hard time thinking of anything that's off limits for women. Well, you know, you got to wear women's pants, they say. Well, you know, what's the difference between women's pants and men's pants? It's a little more tighter and form-fitting. That's not modest anyway, you know. So, again, uh, by the way, most churches, you won't hear this anymore Amen. because it's unpopular. Yep. Yeah. But honestly, you know... I, my goal is not to be popular. My goal is to tell you the truth, you know, and, and don't get mad at me and don't kill the messenger. This used to be even believed by the public school system. Even in the United States, less than 100 years ago, it was illegal for a woman to go in public in pants. Did you know that? There were women arrested uh, in the early part of the century for cross-dressing because they were wearing pants. They were uh, arrested and booked under cross-dressing uh, because of the fact that uh, our society has always recognized pants as men's clothing and skirts and dresses as clothing for ladies. And so I'm not going to change on that. Amen. You know, and even if I'm all by myself in a wilderness, even if a lot of the pastors that I know now, you know, their whole family, their wives and children are all, you know, uh, poured into a tight pair of pants, you know what? 
I'm not going to change because I, I don't believe in it. I don't think it's right. I think that there should be a difference. By the way, I just like the way my wife looks in a skirt better than she looks in a pair of pants. Why would you not want your wife to be feminine? You know, why would you want your wife to, you know. I mean, I'd rather have a feminine wife. It's more attractive, you know. And, and by the way, manly men are more attractive too than queer little sissies, All right? Okay. So anyway, you know, that was just kind of a little commercial break there on, on the part about girding up your loins like a man. But look at verse 8. It says, Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Hast thou an arm like God? Now, verses 9 through 14 all go together in one unit. He starts out with the phrase, Hast thou an arm like God? And then it, you realize by verse 14 that he's talking about salvation. Now, God's arm is often in the Bible associated with his power to save. Why? Because the arm is often associated with strength. You know, when someone wants to show you that they're strong, somebody, you know, people will flex their muscle. You know, the arm is something that's often associated with strength. The legs are associated with strength in the Bible. And God often refers to his saving power by the strength of his arm and how his arm brings salvation. So that's why he says there, hast thou an arm like God? He's saying, do you have the power that God has? But let's keep reading. It says, or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency and array thyself with glory and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath and behold everyone that is proud and abase him. Look on everyone that is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in secret. Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. Now I love this passage. This has always been one of my favorite uh, little passages where God speaks about how ridiculous it is to think that you can be saved outside of the Lord Jesus, outside of calling upon the name of the Lord. Because he says, this is the checklist that you would have to perform if you want God to consider you worthy of salvation on your own. I mean, for you to be able to, to save yourself, he said, you'd have to be able to do all this. Isn't that what he said? Because he said, if you do this, 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 and this, verse 14, then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. Look, none of us can be saved outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And people think there are exceptions to this. You know, they think that somebody who's just a really good person, a really godly person, a person who's really righteous, somehow gets a pass into heaven through their own works. And the Bible makes it clear that there is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we're saved by grace, and grace means it's something that we do not deserve. You know, people will often say, you know, oh, you know, you're saying that a woman who wears pants is a sinner. Well, but guess what? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So why would you have such a hard time just admitting, hey, that's wrong? You know, and then people will say, oh, you said that if, if women wear pants, they're going to go to hell. No, here's the thing. Anybody's going to go to hell that doesn't believe in Jesus. And anybody who believes in Jesus, their sins are going to be forgiven, whatever the sins may be, whatever the greatness or, or smallness of their sins. But the Bible says here that our right, own right hand can't save us. And our right hand will represent our strength, our ability, the works that we do. The Bible tells us that it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's the power of God that saves us, not our own power, not our own strength. Now, if you would flip over to Isaiah 53. While you're turning there, let me just read you that list again of, uh, if you say, well, I, you know, I don't think I need Jesus to be saved because I'm a pretty good person. I think I can get there on my own. Well, here's the checklist again that you have to be able to perform in order to be uh, considered able to save yourself. Okay, uh, you have to be able to uh, thunder with a voice like God. You have to be able to deck yourself with majesty and excellency. You say, well, I dress pretty well. I think I can handle that. Uh, you know, array thyself with glory and beauty. Check. I got that. Okay, cast abroad the rage of thy wrath and behold everyone that is proud and abase him. Are you able to humble and humiliate every proud person on this planet and bring them to their knees? <laughs> I mean, think about that. 
I mean, there are a lot of proud people in this world, a lot of arrogant people. Are you able to bring them all to their knees? But you know what Jesus is? Because the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. He's going to bring everybody down low. He's going to humble everybody. Everybody who's proud is going to be abased, but only by Jesus, not by you. Saving yourself is, is of a similar, you know, magnitude or it would take similar strength to be able to do the one you got you, you, to be able to do the other. And so it says here, you know, you'd have to look on everyone that is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. These are all things that the Lord Jesus will do in the end times. Hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in secret. Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. Now, Isaiah is a powerful passage. Isaiah 53, it's one of these really classic uh, messianic passages, you know, that's, that's prophesying the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first verse is what I want to point out. It says in, in verse 1, Who hath believed our report... And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, you stay there. I'm just going to read for you from John 12, where it says in verse 37, But though they had done, he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, saying they didn't believe on Jesus, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? This passage is also quoted in Romans chapter 10, in the famous passage that talks about that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. All the great things in that passage, they point to this and they quote Isaiah 53, 1, that has to do with the fact that believing on Jesus Christ, believing the report or believing the record that God gave of his son has to do with an acknowledgement of the power of God to save you. Jesus has the power to save you. It's not through your own power. It's not through your strength. You have to rely on him to save you. Now back up to chapter 52, verse 10. The Bible says in chapter 52, verse 10, the Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. So he's saying, I'm going to expose my saving power to the whole world. I'm going to expose salvation to all nations. And then in 53.1, he says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Notice how it's all in the past tense. Even though this is written, you know, 700 some years before the Lord Jesus Christ, because God knows the end from the beginning, and God speaks of the things which be not as though they were. He'll often talk about future prophetic events in the past tense. He says in verse 7, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. Jump down to verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Watch this. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. This is not the Messiah that the Jews are looking for. They're not looking for somebody to come and be an offering for their sin. You know, they're looking for a guy who's going to basically take over the whole world and put them in charge so that they can rule over the world and that they can receive all the gold and silver of all the Gentiles and they can rule and reign from their precious uh, land over in Palestine. So uh, that, this is not what they're looking for, but this is a great prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it has to do with the salvation that only Jesus Christ can bring. 
God's holy arm of salvation, God's great power and might to save was demonstrated through the ministry, the death, burial, and most importantly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's, the, that's where it was revealed unto all nations. This is actually a theme in the book of Isaiah also. Go back to chapter 51. It, we could show you a lot of places in Isaiah just because it's, it's something that God speaks of over and over again. His arm, his saving power, and so forth. But just to back up a couple of pages, it says in chapter 51, verse 5, My righteousness is near. My salvation is gone forth, and mine arms shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and watch this, and on mine arm shall they trust. So when the Bible talks about trusting on the arm of the Lord, you know, we know in chapter 53 that's revealed as, as Jesus that they're trusting in to be saved because God's power to save is through the Lord Jesus. Now flip over, if you would, to chapter 59. While you're turning to chapter 59, I'll read for you from Isaiah 63, 5. And I looked and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me and my fury, it upheld me. Now, here's the thing. There's nobody else that can save you. That's why uh, Isaiah also says in chapter 53, he says, I'm the Lord. I even I am the Lord in verse 11. And beside me, there is no savior. You see that? Without Jesus, there's no Savior. There's only one. And that's why uh, the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But let me explain something to you about salvation. A lot of times when the Bible talks about salvation, it's talking about going to heaven. You know, it's talking about escaping hell. And that's the salvation that we most often think of, right? Having eternal life, going to heaven escaping the fires of hell. That's the most important salvation that there is. Because what does a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and, and lose his own soul? And so the most important salvation is the salvation of our soul. But God often also provides physical salvation, meaning that we could be in a bad situation and the Lord could step in and save us, you know, physically. That's what the Bible talks about in Matthew 24 when it says, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened because there are times we're in a jam, we just need physical salvation. Like, for example, when Peter was sinking in the Sea of Galilee, he said, Lord, save me. He wasn't trying to get to heaven. He was already spiritually saved, but he was calling out to the Lord to physically pull him out of the water because he was going to drown. Okay, so we got to be careful when we read the Bible that sometimes that's the salvation being referred to. Look at uh, Isaiah 59, 16. It says in verse uh, 16 there, and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. And by the way, we know that the intercessor is Jesus because the Bible says there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And an intercessor and a mediator are pretty much a go-between, two different words for the same thing. So the Bible is saying there is no intercessor outside of the Lord, outside of Jesus. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. Look at verse 17. This should be familiar to you. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Of the armor of the Lord in Ephesians 6. It says, upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him and the redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Now, let's stop and think about this for a moment. The Bible talks about the Lord's glory being known and his glory being seen uh, when salvation comes. Now, when it says in verse 20, the Redeemer, do you see that at the beginning of verse 20? Who are we talking about? I mean, who is our Redeemer? There's only one. There's only one Redeemer. There's only one uh, Savior that we have, and that Redeemer is the Lord Jesus. And it says, and the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. But back up and look at verse 19. It says, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. So what do we see here? Enemies 
coming in like a flood. What's Zion? Jerusalem, right? Enemies coming in like a flood, and then the Lord lifts up a standard against them. The Redeemer comes and defends them, right? But look, it says, Unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. You know, is that saying that God's just going to defend everybody in Jacob? Just everybody in Jacob is just defended. No, it's those that turn from transgression. See, here's the thing. When it comes to personal salvation, it's just based on faith in Jesus. But when it comes to the salvation of a nation physically, you know, you, you kind of turn away from sin for that nation to be spared. For example, in Jonah's day, they had to turn from their evil way, the Bible says. It says God saw their works that they turned from evil ways. So here's the thing, we're not saved by works. When it comes to our soul, heaven and hell is based on faith in Jesus. But here's the thing, though. If we go out and live a sinful life, God punishes us on this, on this earth. So here's the thing. If we're living a really sinful and ungodly life, you know, God could allow bad things to happen to us and not necessarily defend us, you know, but, but the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. Now go over to Psalm chapter number 44, because we'll see almost the same thing, the same idea of the Lord's arm and the salvation that it brings. The Lord's arm brings spiritual salvation through faith in Jesus, but the Lord's arm also brings uh, physical salvation when we need help, you know, when, whenever we just call out to him to get us out of a bad situation or to protect us. You know, as David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. A lot of people in the Bible would call out to God when they were in a jam. You know, you think of battles where the Israelites were losing, and then they'd call out to the Lord, and he'd step in and, and save them in, in a physical way. But uh, which psalm did I have you turn to? Let me get there myself. Psalm 44. Look at verse 1. It says, We've heard with our ears, O, o God, our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days in the times of old, how thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantest them, how thou didst afflict the people and cast them out. Verse 3, For they got not the land in possession by their own sword. Watch this. Neither did their own arm save them. So here we're talking about salvation from physical enemies. We're talking about how when the children of Israel possessed the promised land, it wasn't through their own arm, it was through the Lord's power that they got that land. It says, But thy right hand and thine arm, and the light of thy countenance, because thou hadst a favor unto them. Thou art my king, O God. Command deliverances for Jacob. Jacob is another name for Israel. Through thee will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them under that rise up against thee. For I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. But thou hast saved us from our enemies and hast put them to shame that hated us. In God we boast all the day long and praise thy name forever. See, so look, we should rely on the Lord for our salvation. I'd say 90-some percent of the people here have already done that. Hopefully 100%. You know, the vast majority of the people here are already saved. They already believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. But we should also rely on them for physical protection. Amen. Safety is of the Lord. Amen. We should also rely on him to, to guard our home, to guard our, our, our families, you know, just to guard our nation. But wait a minute, the problem is our nation's turned away from God. Therefore, I don't know if our nation can really rely on God to protect. So then on an individual level, we just need God to protect us, protect our family, protect our church. And we need to pray to that effect. Because honestly, rather than having the best security system in the world, the best weapons, the best watchdog, you'd be safer if you just knew the Lord's protecting you. But when the Lord's not protecting you, anything can break through if he wants it to. Oh man, the U.S. has the most powerful military, but God can bring it down. You know, it'd be better if we, if we just had the Lord on our side, if we just had Jesus in our corner, if we just had the Redeemer to come. Now, a lot of people will love to quote these kind of passages that talk a lot about Israel and Jacob being defended from armies and people gathered against it. And they like to apply that to the modern day nation of Israel. Here's the problem with that. They don't have the Redeemer. They don't have Jesus. And the Bible says, whosoever denieth the Son... The same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges that the Son hath the Father also. You say, well, they, got God the, they still have God the Father. Wrong. You either have both or you have nothing. He that receiveth you receiveth me, Jesus said, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. And if you reject him, he said, you reject my Father. He that hateth me 
hateth my father also, Jesus said. And let me tell you something. Uh, those people over in Israel today, all those Polish people living over there, they hate the Lord Jesus. They are not saved. Therefore, they don't have the Redeemer in their corner. Now, I'm going to prove that to you from this passage because it'd be easy to just stop at verse 8 and say, oh yeah, God's protecting Israel right now, you know, from, from Hamas. And it's funny because somebody just emailed me. Actually, Brother Chris Segura just emailed me this today. You got to hear this. Just listen to this. And then we're going to see what the Bible says right here in the passage that you're looking at. Somebody sent me this today from Chick Publications. This is just hot off their presses, four o'clock today. God still fights for Israel. Okay, just listen to this. It is said that other nations do not use Israeli wars and military training materials because the outcomes of Israel's battles make no logical sense. An older video made the rounds a few years ago called Against All Odds describing multiple acts of God. I thought that was Chuck Norris's uh, life story biography, but whatever, different against all odds. Describing multiple acts of God during Israel's many fights for existence. A sudden sandstorm uncovered a minefield. Enemy soldiers fled after seeing apparitions of a giant warrior. And then it shows a picture of a bunch of antichrist Jews uh, with their satanic prayer book of vain repetitions that blasphemes Jesus. And they're at the Wailing Wall praying unto uh, Moloch or, or Remphan or whoever they pray to. Yeah. No, no, they pray to the Lord. No, they don't have the Father because they don't have the Son. Amen. But anyway, so they're, they're sitting there in this picture. Listen to this. And the pattern seems to be continuing. Israel has developed an anti-rocket system called Iron Dome. Well, they're going to need it because they don't have Jesus. <laughs> they better have an Iron Dome. But he says, uh, you know, that's been defending major cities such as Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. A commander in charge of one of the Iron Dome batteries watched a Hamas missile on target to land in central Tel Aviv. <laughs> Two of his interceptor rockets missed it. <laughs> as he watched, the Iron Dome, which calculates wind speed, picked up a strong east wind that diverted the missile into the sea. <laughs> Just trying to keep the kids engaged in the service. The commander said that all he could do was stand up and shout, there is a God. No, there's not a God. There's Jesus. Amen. Not just a God. His name, he has a name. Jesus. Okay. But anyway, no, there's a God. Well, thou believest that there's one God. Thou doest well. So does the devil. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it's, you got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But anyway, he said, there's a God. When one Hamas terrorist was asked why their rockets were aimed so poorly, he was quoted in the Jewish Telegraph complaining, we do aim them, but their God changes their path in midair. Listen, you know why he said that? Because he was probably an agent of Mossad. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's probably a Mossad agent. That's why I said that. But anyway, oh, their God is diverting our missiles. Yeah, that's pretty convenient. But anyway, one Israeli senior officer reported, this, this is from Chick Publication. One Israeli senior officer reported that a planned pre-dawn raid on Gaza was delayed until sunrise, exposing his men to the enemy. However, a heavy fog suddenly appeared, shrouding their movements while they finished the mission. It really was a fulfillment of the verse in the Bible, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to give you victory, he said, quoting Deuteronomy 20, verse 4. From Abraham to today, a parade of stories illustrate that Jehovah has not abandoned his people. God promised the Jews that when they strayed into idolatry, they would lose the land and be scattered throughout the earth. That is a lie. That is not what the Bible said. He said that when they rejected the Son of God, they'd be scattered. Did you hear that lie? Oh, God said, look, get out of the Old Testament and get in the New Testament. You know, God said that he would scatter them because of idolatry. He already did that in the days of Nebuchadnezzar long before Jesus. The real reason, go to, well, stay there, stay in Psalm. But anyway, if you want to read it later, in Matthew 21, he says, look, he sent all the prophets. Lastly, he sent his son. They rejected the son, and you know what he said? Burn down their city. Break down their town. Look. Jesus said, your house is left unto you desolate. He said, not one stone of this temple is going to be left upon another. Why? Because they rejected the Son of God. See, this lying article says that the Bible predicted them being scattered because of idolatry. Newsflash, in the first century, in the time of Christ, the Jews didn't worship idols. Show me in the Bible where the Jews were worshiping idols in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, why'd they go to Babylon 600 years earlier, uh, you know, idols? But wait a minute. 
They weren't worshiping idols in Jesus' day. They were scattered. This lying article doesn't want to acknowledge they were really scattered because they rejected Jesus. That's what he said would happen in chapters 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. He gives parable after parable, making it real clear why they're scattered, rejecting Jesus. Okay. Then he says this, you know, oh, God promised the Jews that when they strayed into idolatry, they would lose the land and be scattered throughout the earth. For nearly 2,000 years, they've suffered almost universal hatred in dozens of countries. But he promised that afterward to gather them back from the ends of the earth. In our generation, we've watched that happen. So according to him, they're scattered because of idolatry and they brought them back. You know why he doesn't want to say they're scattered for rejecting Jesus? Because then you'd be like, well, wait a minute, why would he bring them back when they still reject Jesus? That wouldn't make any sense, would it? Listen to this. It says, now as Zechariah predicted, Jerusalem has become a burdensome stone for all people. All the people of the earth will be gathered against it. But the God of Israel promised in that same verse, all that burden themselves with Jerusalem shall be cut in pieces. Books could be written of nations and whole empires that have offended God by persecuting his chosen people. None retain their glory and power for long. One nation stands out in its history of welcoming the Jews, the USA. But that is not without periodic relapses. In much of the 20th century and even today, U.S. policy became increasingly ambivalent toward the Jews and the new nation of Israel. Many have watched the pattern of God's swift rebukes when Israel's offended. Watch it and don't offend Israel. In his book, As America Has Done to Israel, author John McTurnan reports story after story of disasters in America coinciding with some insult, betrayal, or failure to bless Israel. So according to them, like God's just bringing all this wrath on us every time we just make a misstep in regard to Israel. If we don't bless them enough or if we, you know, whatever, as a nation. His 320 page book will convince you. You know, I got a book that's longer than 320 pages that ought to convince you that this is a bunch of garbage. Well, well he's got a 320 page book. Well, you know, okay. Uh, <laughs> we'll convince you that God has not abandoned his people and that we as Americans must not either. The, the, so according to this, the, the unbelieving Jews are God's people. Weird. The tract, Somebody's Angry. So they're selling tracts because it's Chick Publication. They sell a tract called Somebody's Angry. Carries the same theme, making it easy to open the eyes of other people. Another tract describes what our attitude should be. Love the Jewish people. God promises to the children of Israel still stands. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Oh, wait, let, let's see what this 320 page book says. Look down at your Bible in Psalm 44. We just read, didn't we just read out? Oh, God's going to protect. He's going to defend Israel. It's going to be great. He's going to defeat all their enemies. He's going to tear it up. Okay, let's keep reading verse 9. But thou hast cast off and put us to shame and goest not forth with our armies. Now, was God going forth with their armies at this time? Thou cast us off, put us to shame, goest not forth with our armies. Thou makest us to turn back from the enemy and they which hate us spoil for themselves. Thou hast given us like sheep appointed for meat and hast scattered us among the heathen. Thou sellest thy people for naught and dost not increase thy wealth by their price. Thou makest us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to them that are round about. Thou makest us a byword among the heathen, a shaking of the head among the people. Now, let me ask you this. Where was the big giant apparition of a giant warrior then? Where was the sandstorm then? Where was the east wind then? It wasn't there because they had been cast off because they had turned away from the Lord. And let me tell you something. The children of Israel today, over in that land, we, you know, which are roughly kind of sort of a little bit descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, <laughs> you know, in addition to being really Polish and Khazarian, you know, but here's the thing. Uh, those people, are there, they don't have the Redeemer. They don't have God. They don't have Jesus. You know, this article didn't mention Jesus one time. It's real careful to call him, you know, Jehovah. Still loves his people. L like, like Jehovah's got his people, and then Jesus has got his people. Well, let me explain something to you. Jesus is Jehovah. And there's only one people of God. And it's believers. It's the saved. It's the chosen generation. The royal priesthood. The holy nation. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. Welcome to the New Testament, my friend. 
And this idea, go back to Job if you would. Let's, get, let's crank out Behemoth quickly. But anyway, we'll talk more about him in the Leviathan chapter if you want. But, you know, I just have to show you that because it just never ceases to amaze me that the cognitive dissonance practiced by people who still believe that the Jews are God's chosen people. But it's like, well, are they going to heaven? No. Are they going to hell? Yes. Are they saved? No. So why would God be saving them physically? He's not saving them spiritually. I mean, is that guy at the wailing wall, you know, going, is that guy praying to the Lord according to the Bible? He doesn't have the son. He doesn't have the father. So he can go like this, like an autistic person all day long. And you know what? He's going to burn in hell. He hates the Lord. You say, why are you so mad at the Jews? Oh, maybe because they said Jesus is a bastard and Mary's a whore. Yep. I, I get offended by people saying that about my Savior. Yep. You know what I mean? I get offended when people say that my Savior is a sorcerer and that he's a fraud and that he's, uh, that he's uh, being punished and dung in hell for all eternity. You know, that, that offends me. And in fact, my Bible says that the Jews are enemies of the gospel. You know, and you say, well, we should still love them. Well, yeah, of course we should still love unsaved people. I mean, I love Muslims too, though. You need to love the Jewish people. I do. I, I've given the gospel to plenty of Jewish people, and, and I wanted them to get saved. I didn't want them to go to hell. I wanted them to get saved. Amen. But you know what? We shouldn't love them any more or less than anybody else because we shouldn't be a racist Amen. that says that your race makes you more loved by God. Yeah. Avoid genealogies. Yeah. We're all one in Christ Jesus. You know, we're all the same. But, you know, I do, I do get angry about somebody who blasphemes Jesus. I do get angry about somebody who, who uh, denies the Son and, deny, and, and teaches a spirit of Antichrist. And, and, you know, to sit there, you know, these lying signs and wonders, that's all these are. If you want to be, and it's funny, you'll show people stuff from the Bible about how they're not God's people, they've been rejected, they've been cast off except for the believing remnant that's saved by grace, according to Romans 11, 1 through 7. You show them verses and that's what they say. Oh, but don't you know that God helped them win the battle in 1948 and 1967? Now look, if you base what you believe on these type of miracles instead of on the word of God, are you going to fall for the Antichrist? Because the Bible says the Antichrist is going to do all kinds of miracles, going to bring down fire. from. But you say, oh, no, no, but, but Pastor Harrison, explain the miracles. Well, Janus and Jambres did miracles. Yeah. The Egyptian sorcerers did miracles. You know, oh, wow. first of all, this stuff probably never even happened. Right. It's probably a fable. Remember the Bible said avoid Jewish fables? Okay. So, you know, it's probably just a fable. But even if it did happen, so what? It doesn't mean anything. Because I don't base what I believe on sandstorms and giant ghosts and, you know, some, you know, some giant warrior apparition, you know, some ghost, some fiction. I don't base what I believe on that, you know, and I don't base it on some 320 page book either. You know, I base it on the New Testament and the New Testament is crystal clear on this subject. The only people who don't believe in it are people who are just really emotional about just their love for J Jerusalem and Jew Jewish thing. And they, t they want to talk about Jewishness. I want to talk about Jesusness. You know, we need to get back to our Jewish roots. Uh, let's get to the Jesus roots. You know, and Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and Omega. And that's, those are Greek letters, by the way. But anyway, let's hurry up and finish in Job 40. That's a whole sermon of itself. Jews and their lies, part three. But anyway, <laughs> you know, uh, Job chapter four. Why did I show you all those verses? Those were all verses that had to do with the Lord's arm saving. He's the only one who can save you spiritually. But you know what? He's the only one that can save you physically, too, when you need it. He's not saving them. The devil's saving them because they don't believe in Jesus. But let me tell you something. We should rely on Jesus for personal safety. We shouldn't go through life scared and worried. You know, we should rely on Jesus for personal safety because he, he's promised that the angel of the Lord camps about them that fear him. He's promised that he's given us his angels charge concerning us. And that the angels are ministering spirits sent forth the minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. God can protect us. Let's quickly deal with behemoth and, and go home. It says in verse 15, Behold now behemoth which I made with thee. Now that proves right there that dinosaurs and man existed together. Because this behemoth is clearly a dinosaur. He's a gigantic creature. Uh, now some commentaries, which throw out all commentaries. Amen. Throw out all study Bibles. You know, get just the word of God and let the Holy Spirit comment on it. 
but and let preachers, spirit-filled preachers comment on it, but not books made by man to comment on it and to guide you. You should have a private Bible time where it's just you and the Lord and no one else. But uh, commentaries and state Bibles will often say this is an elephant. But the proof that this is not an elephant is in verse 17 when it says, he moveth his tail like a cedar. Now, who, who knows what an elephant's tail looks like? <laughs> it's not like a cedar. I mean, it's like a little nothing of a tail, right? It's this little tiny, you know, this little swinging, little swishing, like a very thin rope. A cedar is a big, giant tree. So there's no way this is an elephant because whatever this gigantic beast is, you know, it, 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 first of all, it sounds big, even bigger than an elephant. Now, elephants are huge. Yeah, I'm not really real big on zoology, but my guess is that an elephant is probably the largest land animal uh, on this earth at this time. I, I believe that obviously the largest animal is the, is the blue whale, which will also be the largest mammal. But the elephant is the largest land animal. I, are you nodding your head? All right, I got, uh, uh, okay, uh, we first of the motion, can I get a second? Will someone second that? All right, all in favor say aye. All right, opposed, same, it's carried. So we've just declared the elephant to be the largest animal uh, on the planet that's, that's a land animal. But he says here, um, you know, his tail's like a cedar. That's not an elephant. But if you think about what's commonly shown as like a brontosaurus, you know what I mean? Big, giant tail and so forth. That really fits. How did, how did Job know this? How did the Bible know? Dinosaurs were discovered in the 1800s. And people say, oh, dinosaurs prove that the Bible's false. No, dinosaurs prove the Bible's true. Because they were discovered in the 1800s, and we already read about Behemoth and Leviathan long before they were ever discovered. So it just confirms the Bible. And what's interesting, it says he was made with thee. That's because God made the land animals on day six, and he made man on day six the same day. So he made them together. He made them at the same time. And this shows that it wasn't like there was some pre-existent deal where dinosaurs ruled the earth and then later man came on the scene. No. And look, do you think that anything in the Bible is accidental? Those little, why would he say, behold, I made behemoth with you? Why even bring that up? Because he knew that people would say it was made at a different time. Just like he knew people would teach the lie of evolution. That's why he said everything brings forth after its own kind. So he puts these things in for a reason. I made them with you. Showing man and dinosaurs living together. It says, he eateth grass as an ox. So this gigantic beast is, is herbivore in nature. It says, lo, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. The stones are basically his uh, reproductive anatomy. His bones are strong, as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword approach unto him. Saying, God saying, I can defeat him. You know, but man is going to have a hard time defeating Behemoth. And then it says, uh, Surely the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees and the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river. So it's a huge beast. He drinketh up a river and hasteth not. He trusteth, meaning, you know, in his own mind, he trusteth he can draw up Jordan into his mouth, you know, a major river. He taketh it with his eyes, his nose pierceth through snares. And then in verse uh, one of the next chapter, he begins to describe another creature, Leviathan. You know, canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Leviathan is a sea creature. That's why he's talking about fishing with a hook, you know, pull him out of the sea. So we have this great land animal, behemoth, and a great sea creature, Leviathan. Now you say, Pastor Harrison, you know, do you believe in all the different dinosaurs that are out there? You know, I think a lot of them are just made up, to be honest, because, <laughs> you know, they'll find one bone and then construct the whole, you know, people, they see those big dinosaur skeletons and they don't realize like one of those is a real bone and then everything else is, is fabricated. Yeah. So you can't just believe everything here because a lot of these dinosaurs I believe are fictitious. You know, especially when you look at something like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Now, I'm not saying there wasn't an animal similar to that or somewhat like that. But when you look at how it's just this big, strong body, strong legs, strong head, and then these little chicken arms. Like, <laughs> you know, and I think that what they're trying to do with that image of those little arms is just to basically say like, oh, see, it's not really developed yet. And, you know, modern science believes 
you know, you found it hard to believe that you were descended physically from Jacob and, 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 and the 12 tribes. You know, modern science believes that the modern day chicken evolved from Tyrannosaurus Rex. Look it up. Look it up in all the scientific journals and the well respect. And, you know, you can't expect an ignoramus like me, you know, a religious kind of, you know, one of these guys is still in the Bronze Age to really understand the greatness of the science behind the fact, you know, that chickens are the modern day Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> but look it up. That's what they believe. You know, that a you know, and quit showing that picture of apes turning into humans. I want to see a picture of Tyrannosaurus Rex turning into a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Evolving into a chicken. I mean, look, chickens are so stupid. We have so many chickens in our backyard. How many chickens do we have, Isaac? Now, we have nine chickens and one rooster. They're fools. I mean, if you, if you watch it, they're the stupidest animal ever. You're just shaking your head at these things. I mean, that's after all these millions of years of evolution. I mean, what was that, what was that Tyrannosaurus doing? I mean, how stupid was the Tyrannosaurus if it evolved into a chicken and the rooster, you know? I mean, just, you know. You know, I guess the Tyrannosaurus was going like this. <laughs> but that's why they give it those little, those little bird things, those little bird legs, because that's supposedly, you know, it's like half evolved. And I think they make dinosaurs look half evolved just to kind of make you think that. You know, if you look at the stuff they actually find, you know, they did find woolly mammoth. Wow, it's a big hairy elephant. Oh, that pr that's a missing link. That proves evolution. What? A saber-toothed tiger, ooh. You know, that's what they actually found. They actually found a saber-toothed tiger. They actually found woolly mammoth. I have no problem believing in those creatures. Very believable. Now, something like a brontosaurus, I have no problem believing it. And you know, I don't, I'm not saying there wasn't some, you know, these bones of Tyrannosaurus. It's obviously some giant animal, you know. I'm just saying they don't know how it looked. And then they'll tell you how its eyesight was. Well, it can only see you when you're moving. What in the world? Like, you're looking at a bone. You're looking at the thing's kneecap. You know, you're telling me, oh, let me tell you about its eyesight. But, you know, it's just the pride and arrogancy of man. So, you know. But anyway, what I'm saying is that this confirms, the Bible's always right. There, there's nothing in this passage that disproves the Bible. It just confirms the Bible. You know, God always knows what he's talking about. And I, you know, my source on dinosaurs, every, here, here's my motto. Everything I needed to know about dinosaurs, I learned from Job 40 and 41. That's all I need. I don't need anything else. You know, I don't need to know about woolly mammoth. You know, I mean, it's, it's dead. It's gone, you know, and, and we lose species every year. So what? <laughs> They're all coming back in the millennium. He's going to make all things new in the new heaven and the new earth. There are going to be pterodactyls and saber-toothed tigers. It's going to be great. Yeah. So, who, you know, just let them go extinct now. Just focus on chickens and cows and pigs and stuff that we like. Okay, well, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and uh, we thank you for your promise of protection, Lord. We thank you for salvation. Lord, it's a blessing to know that all our sins are forgiven. Those people over in, in Israel today are, with, are having no hope and without Christ. They don't have Christ. They have nothing. They're, they're nobody without Jesus. Thank you so much for your son, Lord, that has saved us and has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to your own purpose and grace, which was given us before the world began, Lord. And thank you for also just giving us physical protection, Lord, keeping us safe, Lord. We know we can trust you to keep us safe. And Lord, uh, help us not to be uh, confused by oppositions of science falsely so-called, but to trust your word as the supreme science book, the ultimate science textbook. And in Jesus' name we pray.